The stock market in America is now in its biggest bubble since 1929, suggesting that we could be on the precipice of a massive crash in stock prices unlike anything that we've seen since the Great Depression. And to get a sense of how big this bubble is, take a look at this graph, which is tracking the index value of the S&P 500 all the way back to 1880, over 150 years. You can see that today the stock prices have surged up so high that we are now double or triple long-term valuation levels, suggesting that the decline could be as much as 50%. And folks, if that type of stock market crash were to happen in 2024 and beyond, we would see pandemonium occur in the economy. Because we can see the only other times in US history where stock prices crashed by this much, there was a large associated downturn in the economy. And of course, if there's an associated economic recession where lots of people lose their jobs, that's going to make the decline in the stock market even worse, causing a vicious self-reinforcing cycle that it could drag the entire economy into a massive recession or even a depression like the one we saw back in 1929. Folks, that was one of the last times that we saw the stock market this overvalued. It was back in 1929, directly before the Great Depression. And the way we measure stock market overvaluation on this graph is by looking at the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio for the S&P 500, which is a measure of how stocks are valued relative to the earnings of the company in the index. And what you can see today is that the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio of the stock market is 33, which is now the fourth highest level of all time. The only other times the stock market has been this overvalued was back in late 2021 at the peak of the pandemic bubble, back in 1999 at the peak of the dot-com bubble, and in 1929, right before the Great Depression, suggesting that we have lots of downside in the stock market before prices for stocks align with their long-term fundamental levels relative to company earnings. Now, of course, just because the stock market is overvalued, today doesn't necessarily mean it's going to crash tomorrow. Lots of people have been calling for a stock market crash the last two to three years, and it really hasn't happened yet for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons being that the U.S. government pumped so much money into the economy during the pandemic. They printed $5 trillion, which produced extra liquidity that's still floating around the financial system and artificially propping up asset values and creating a mania unlike anything that we've seen before. With a company like Nvidia, the graphics card maker now surging up to a stock price of $790 a share. Folks, you can see that this is more than five times what their stock price was a year and a half ago. And it's really these parabolic increases in stock prices that you gotta watch out for out there. This is the telltale sign of a bubble. And my fear is that when this bubble pops, maybe sometime in 2024, maybe sometime in 2025, we don't know exactly when the bubble's gonna pop, but we know at some point it will. My fear is that people are not prepared for what's gonna happen. Because everyone right now is kind of buying into this narrative that the US economy is strong, that the higher stock market is reflecting like wider strength in the US economy, but folks, it's all an illusion. It's an illusion driven by the fact that there's a handful of high-performing stocks right now that are creating the impression that the overall stock market and economy is healthy. Because research from Deutsche Bank, everyone, is showing a very interesting trend in the stock market right now. They're showing on this graph how concentrated the performance of the stock market is today. And what you can see, they're measuring that by the concentration of the top 10% of stocks versus the entire stock market. And what you can see right now is that the top 10% of stocks comprise almost 75% of the market itself. This is the highest level of stock market concentration since 1929, everyone, right before the Great Depression. With this high level of stock market concentration being driven by seven companies, everyone, they're called the Magnificent Seven. And these companies, they're performing much better than the market overall. And as a result, these seven companies now comprise almost 30% of the stock market on their own. With these companies being Microsoft, Apple, the aforementioned NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Google, which is called Alphabet, as well as Tesla, they comprise over 28% of the value of the S&P 500 on their own. And so folks, I want you to zoom out and think about that for a second. We have seven companies comprising 28% of the market 
whereas the other 493 companies in the S&P 500 only comprise 72%. And so we have those big companies performing really well, which is driving the performance in the stock market overall. However, the smaller companies, they're not performing nearly as good. With the Wall Street Journal reporting at the end of 2023 that the Magnificent Seven saw 74% appreciation on the year, while the remaining 493 companies in the S&P 500 only saw 11% appreciation. Meanwhile, these seven large companies in America, their market cap is now higher than the combined market capitalization of the stock markets in Japan, France, China, and the UK, which creates significant risk, everyone, to have so few of our eggs in one basket in the US economy and stock market increases the risk that there could be some type of black swan event that hurts these companies that causes the market overall to crash. And if the stock market were to crash, I fear that we will enter a negative feedback loop where consumers feel less wealthy because they have less in their stock portfolios and 401ks and as a result, spend less in the economy. And this relationship between stock market wealth and spending in the economy is known as the wealth effect. It's a behavioral economic theory suggesting that people spend more as the value of their assets rise. The idea is that consumers feel more financially secure and confident about their wealth when their homes or investment portfolios increase in value. They are made to feel richer even if their income and fixed costs are the same as before, and so they spend more. Now, this wealth effect, it's a positive for the economy when the value of assets are going up, right? Because you know, if you look in your 401k or you look in your stock portfolio, or you look at the value of your house and you see it up 20% over the last couple of years or 30%, you feel better about your financial prospects. So maybe you spend more on the margins, which drives economic growth, increases company profits, which then causes their stock price to go up by more, increasing the wealth effect and so on in a positive direction. However, that positive direction isn't gonna last forever. And when it breaks, when it pops, the downturn to the fundamental value where stocks and houses should be valued at could be severe, everyone. This is the thing that you gotta understand if you're someone who owns stocks or you own a house or you just wanna understand what's going on in the economy, you have to understand that we're in the biggest asset bubble of all time. There is no question about that. Almost all of the fundamental indicators say that asset prices today are way detached from their long-term historical fundamentals. And one way to understand this is simply by comparing the value of the stock market to GDP in America. And you can see today that the aggregate value of the stock market in America is $51 trillion. So 51 trillion is the aggregate value of all those companies in the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 and the Dow Jones, 50 trillion. And that value is now significantly higher than US GDP, which is 28 trillion. So the US produces 28 trillion in output and income per year, but yet the value of the stock market is 50 trillion. And it's this disconnect that has me very, very concerned, very, very worried. Because if you go back historically, you can see actually that in like 2010, in the 2000s, GDP and the stock market were pretty much equal to each other. And actually back in the 90s and 80s and 70s, our GDP was higher than the value of the stock market. And so when you're in a situation like we were in the 90s where our economy was bigger than the stock market, that was good because that suggested that like there's a future runway for growth in the value of stocks. However, now we're in the opposite situation where the stock market's worth way more than GDP, suggesting that we need lots and lots of growth in our underlying economy to catch up with those stock prices to make today's valuations justified. And so ultimately, this is the key question you have to ask yourself if you're someone who wants to understand where the stock market's going. Do you think that the stock market being at a super high level today is indicating that we're in an economy that's gonna grow significantly in the future? Or do you think that the stock prices being so high today is simply the sign of a bubble and that the fundamentals aren't there to support it? And one person who I suspect might think that stocks are overvalued today is 
the investing guru Warren Buffett, because he actually came up with an indicator called the Buffett indicator, which suggests that, yeah, the stock market is really overvalued today. With the Buffett indicator being a valuation multiple used to assess how expensive or cheap the aggregate stock market is at any given point in time. Buffett called this indicator back in 2001 probably the best single measure of where valuations stand at any given moment. And the way it's calculated is by taking the market capitalization of the Wilshire 5000, which is basically the stock market overall, comparing it to US GDP. Buffett acknowledged that this metric is a simple one and has limitations. However, the underlying theoretical basis for comparing stock prices to GDP is considered reasonable. For example, studies have shown a consistent and strong annual correlation between GDP growth and corporate profit growth. However, the same studies show a poor annual correlation between GDP growth and equity returns, underlying Buffett's belief that when equity prices get ahead of corporate profits, proxied by gross domestic product, poor returns will follow. And so here we have the uh, Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, the biggest investing guru in US history, um, talking about a model he developed that suggests the stock market is tremendously overvalued today. With stock prices as a percentage of GDP resting at 180%, right now almost double the long-term historical average. And so this is the second indicator I have presented to you in this video that shows that the US stock market is significantly overvalued. The first was the Robert Schiller cyclically adjusted PE ratio, which showed as much as 50% downside to get back to historical norms. And now we have the Warren Buffett stock market to GDP indicator suggesting there could be 50% downside to get back to historical norms, which is a huge problem everyone, because more and more in our society, people and consumers are relying on the stock market to fund their living and to fund their retirement, which is the other key point that you need to understand about the risks in the stock market and economy right now, is that actually a very small share of individuals owns most of the stock market. And those individuals happen to be baby boomers. The Wall Street Journal reporting that baby boomers got hooked on stocks and now they can't let go. With nearly two thirds of US adults age 65 and older having money in stocks. You can see that this rate of stock ownership for the older generation significantly outpaces the rate of stock ownership for those 18 to 29 of only whom 40% own stocks. However, the real metric we need to look at is the value of corporate equities owned by generation. And what you can see here is that Baby boomers own approximately 50% of the stock market on their own, with the silent generation owning about 20%. So the silent generation is the generation older than the baby boomers. Then you have the baby boomers. So between those two, the oldest generations in America, they own 70% of the stock market. And then Generation X owns about 20 to 25% of the stock market with then a very small share of the stock market being owned by millennials. And why that is important is because right now the US is going through a retirement wave. The retirements in the US are surging right now due to um, the pandemic a couple years ago, as well as the overall aging of the US population. With Axios reporting that retirements spike again as the stock market booms, with an estimated excess 2.7 million retirees in the most recent year, the highest level of all time, you can see these retirements have absolutely spiked since the pandemic. What this means is that an increasing share of the US population is becoming almost solely reliant on the stock market for their income and their feelings of wealth and security. So you have to ask yourself, what's gonna happen when inevitably the stock market does start to decline? When the recession does start in earnest, we could potentially see a wave of panic selling from the baby boomer population that is almost hard to even fathom right now. Because once the value of stock starts really going down, there will be a huge incentive for many people who are retired or on the verge of retirement to cash out their stock equity and convert it to cash. This is a risk factor the US economy has actually never faced before because our population has never been this old. With data from Statista showing that back in 1950, only 8% of the US population was over the age of 65. However, fast forward to today, and 17% of the US population is now over the age of 65, with a projection of that ratio rising to 22% by 2050. And so more and more of the stock market is now being owned by baby boomers who are becoming increasingly reliant on their stock portfolio to make them feel secure about their future. That creates huge risk 
of panic selling. But folks, I want you to think about that risk combined with the one I talked about in the beginning with a, such a small share of the stock market being driven by the performance of a handful of companies. Right now, the Magnificent Seven, Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Amazon, Meta, Google, and Tesla. They're the ones driving the stock market with the ownership of those stocks being driven by an increasingly narrow share of baby boomers. So when you think about the stock market in that lens, you realize that it is no longer an actual reflection of economic health. That's the key takeaway I really got from doing the research for this video, is that for a long time in America, the stock market was an indicator of what was going on in the economy because its performance was directly linked to the companies that were in the stock market. But no, no longer, it's only a handful of companies driving the performance with a limited share of ownership among wealthy baby boomers driving the demand for those stocks. And ultimately, that's scary because the stock boom, the S&P 500 being above 5,000, this is giving people this kind of false notion that the economy is healthy and it's good, but it's not. It's an illusion. It's a house of cards. And the way we know it's a house of cards is simply by looking at a simple metric like the personal savings rate in America. You know, over the long run, the average American saves about eight and a half percent of their paycheck each month going all the way back to uh, the late 1950s. However, you can see that today's savings rate of 3.7% is well below that long-term average and it's actually um, at almost the lowest level of all time. The only other time we've seen a savings rate this low in America was back in the late 2000s right before the great financial crisis. And so if you know the economy were healthy, if it were good, people would be able to save money more like they did back in the 80s and 90s, but they're not, which is one way you know the economy underlying is not that healthy. Another way you know that the economy is not that healthy is by looking at what's going on with small businesses. Small businesses account for a majority of the companies in America and half the employment, and they're an interesting test case because they don't really you know, benefit from a stock market boom and all you know, the free money and equity going on in the stock market. Small businesses operate fairly normally. You know, it's the profit, it's the loss, it's the debt. And so how they feel about the economy is a really important metric to track. And unfortunately, we have small business optimism at one of the lowest levels in a decade. You can see here that the NFIB, Small Business Optimism Index, is suggesting that businesses are really pessimistic, similar to how they were pessimistic uh, after the last financial crash. With a big reduction occurring right now in how many small businesses are planning to hire, you can see this net rate of positive hiring has fallen to the lowest level in about seven or eight years. And so we have small businesses not hiring, feeling bad about the future, combined with consumers who can't save money, everyone. I mean, that's a recipe for problems in the economy. And the issue I see is that where stock prices are trading right now at super high multiples, at the highest valuations on record, there, there kind of is no room for any type of bad news to come in the economy because where stocks are priced today suggests that we need to continue to see robust growth and robust consumer spending. If we don't, I think it greatly increases the likelihood of a stock market crash. Now, folks, I don't want to be overly negative. I actually want to leave this video on a positive note. You know, and say, say you guys, if you're someone out there who doesn't trust the stock market or you're just looking for um, maybe a way to diversify your investment or exposure, what could you do? You know, what could you do uh, to maybe earn some income and not be as exposed to uh, the volatility inherent in the stock market. And one thing I'm personally doing with my money is investing it in US treasuries. Because you can now see that the rate of interest that you get on a one year US treasury, the yellow line, is 4.9% in early 2024. So you can buy a US government bond and get a 4.9% rate of interest, which is almost three times higher than what the dividend yield is on the S&P 500. Right now, the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is only 1.4%. So on average, if you were to buy a stock in the S&P 500, they'd pay you a dividend of 1.4% of the value that you paid for that stock. You can see that this dividend yield is actually like close to the lowest of all time for the stock market. The long-term uh, average over 150 years is a 4.1% dividend. We're at a 1.4% dividend right now. So you get very little cash by owning stocks, more and more, your returns are based off assuming appreciation is gonna keep going into the future. So maybe one thing you could do is divert some of the money in the stock market portfolio to buying US treasuries where you can clip a nice 5% coupon in the short term. 
Now, to be clear, everyone, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just simply looking at the data and putting my opinions out here on YouTube. If you do elect to make any financial decisions, I would suggest talking to a registered financial advisor. However, to me, the data is pretty clear. We're in a massive stock market bubble, one that we've only seen a couple times before, and there's disturbing similarities right now to what we saw in 1929, right before the Great Depression, and right before stocks went down by 85% in a massive crash. Now, I, I don't think stocks are gonna go down that much again, but we can see kind of folks here, the average correction in a recession market downturn is around 38% in the stock market, and that's at a PE ratio on average of 27 uh, in those stock market bubbles. Today, we're at a PE ratio of 33, according to the Robert Schiller cyclically adjusted PE ratio. So be careful out there, everyone. And if you're someone who uh, enjoyed this content and you wanna see more of it going forward, make sure to tell your friends actually about this video, send it to a friend, and hit the subscribe button below.